Hello, everybody. So I would like to say a few words about our colleague and friend, Pierre Binetrui, who very sadly passed away exactly five months ago uh, after a long struggle against a severe disease. And as uh, Stavros mentioned during the first day, Pierre was initially a member of this organizing committee. So it seemed to us natural to, to devote some time during this conference to uh, honor the, the memory of Pierre, who was really a driving force in the community of particle physics and of cosmology. So I would like to, to present you some highlights. I mean, his career is extremely uh, rich, so I'm just going to, to focus on a few points. But I would like to emphasize that his career, uh, in some sense, is very instructive because it somehow reflects the evolution of the community in particle physics and cosmology. And in, in some respect, he, he was able to anticipate the, the big shifts in the community, in, in the science. So Pierre started uh, his, uh, his career as what I would call a, a pure particle physicist. So he got, he got his PhD in 1980. Uh, his supervisor was Mary Kay Gaillard. And later on, from the, the mid-80s, he started to get interested by cosmological aspects. So he was really interested by the interface between particle physics and, and cosmology. So this was at the time when he got a, a position in, in France, a permanent position in France, in ANSI. And later on, he moved to, to Orsay as a professor. And much later, he came, he came here as a, a professor in Paris Didot. And, <coughs> and after, I mean, so his interest in, into cosmology developed, and in, he still evolved in the last part of his career uh, because he, he got more and more interested by gravitational physics. And he played a crucial role in France uh, in respect to, to this new field of, of physics somehow. So let me start with, uh, with particle physics. Um, so he worked on, on many topics, but I would say that most of his research was focused on super supersymmetric theories. And he was interested by all aspects of super supersymmetric theories. So he was interested by the phenomenology and, and the link with experiments. So he was following carefully the, the evolution of the experiments. He was also interested by really more fundamental aspects of, super, of supersymmetry. So he worked a lot on supersymmetry breaking, for example, the question of mass hierarchy, question of anomalous U, anomalous U1. So he was interested in uh, the um, how superstring theory would uh, appear in terms of, uh, of a super, super symmetric series at, at low energies. And so you can see as an example of, of rather fundamental work, this was a, a physics report given, written with uh, Girardi and Grimm, where um, he was describing a kind of geometric formulation of supergravity coupling. So it's a kind of very formal work on, on supergravity. And finally, he was also interested, uh, as I said, I, as I mentioned before, uh, he was interested in the interface between particle physics and, and cosmology. And he worked more and more on, on this aspect. So his triple interest can be, I mean, can be reflected in the title of his uh, textbook, so, which he published a few years ago, which is an extremely good textbook, if you don't know about it. And, and the title you see is Supersymmetry, Theory, Experiment, and Cosmology. So it's a good summary of his tri 
triple interest into this, all these aspects, all these aspects of uh, supersymmetric series. So let's move now to uh, cosmology. Um, since I'm in front of an audience of cosmologists, and I'm a cosmologist myself, so I will spend more time to, to try to give you a few ideas about his works in this field. Um, so he started to be interested uh, by cosmology, at least in terms of publication in the, in the mid-80s. And he wrote with uh, Mary Kay Gaia one of the first paper, maybe the first, I don't know, which was interested in the construction of inflationary model in the context of superstring theory. And this was one of the first paper where they encountered all the difficulties, you, you are aware of them, to construct uh, a good model of inflation in the context of, uh, of uh, superstring theory. Another important work was uh, his work on quintessence, for example, uh, so much later, after the discovery by the supernova of the accelerated expansion of the universe. And at that time, people were, were working on quintessence models. And, and the idea was to play with potential, various potential of these quintessence models. And one, of, uh, one form of potentials, which is an inverted power law potential, was suggested sometime before by Ratra and Peebles, and Pierre tried to construct uh, supersymmetric models which could give this, this kind of uh, <coughs> potential with an inverted, uh, inverted power law. So this is kind of very useful uh, type of model to, to have what, what are called tracking quintessence models. So this was in the context of uh, supersymmetric models. So another work which had a very strong impact on the community was his work on uh, um, what is called now D-term inflation. I think it was called like this in, in the title of the paper. So this is a work with uh, Giad Valley. And so the idea was to, to consider inflationary models in the context of uh, supergravity models. So if you are in supergravity, you can, you can build a model by introducing some uh, Keller potential here, some super potential, and from these two ingredients, you can construct a uh, Lagrangian for the scalar fields. So you get the kinetic terms for the, for the scalar fields, and you have uh, a potential, and in general, this, this uh, potential is what is called an F potential, so because this combination here is, is an F term. And this is a potential which is derived, which depends, as you can see, from the Keller potential and from the super potential and, and uh, the derivatives. So if you take the, the limit where M Planck goes to infinity, you recover what, what is called the, the global supersymmetry limit, where this potential reduces to this very simple form. And if you try to play with this type of model, with the uh, F term potential, you are faced with uh, the following problem, which is called the eta problem. So eta is this, uh, so I'm not sure you, you can see it clearly, but eta is uh, essentially one of the stroll parameters, which depends on the second derivative of the potential. So it's a dimensionless parameter. And if you want to have a, a good model of inflation, this small parameter, this parameter has to be small, like the first uh, stroll parameter. The problem is when you try to build uh, a model of inflation, and if you take into account the supergravity corrections, you see that the supergravity potential has this exponential k over m Planck square, which appear here. So when you try to, in, in, uh, to take into account this correction from this exponential term, you, you can expand it, and you get this extra term here, which gives, in some sense, an extra contribution to the mass of the scalar field. So here, for simplicity, here I have many scalar fields, but here I've reduced to only one scalar field, which is the inflaton scalar field. And I've, I'm using the canonically normalized form of it. 
And then what, ap what appears is that you get a contribution to the mass of this scalar field, which is of the order V over M Planck square. So this is written here in, so in red, sorry, you don't, you don't see very well. But this contribution is of the order of the Hubble parameter. So in some sense, when you write, when, when you consider the, the effective mass of the scalar field, you get something which is of the, the order of the Hubble parameter. And obviously, you cannot satisfy the condition that eta is much smaller than one. So the idea of Pierre and with the GIA was to, to consider <coughs> what is called uh, the Faye Heliopoulos term if you, have, if you have a U1 symmetry. Um, so it means now you have an extra term in the potential, which is called the D term, hence the term, the, the name of D term inflation. And so let's, let's illustrate with a very simple example, which is give, given in their paper. So let's consider a three scalar field. Um, so the first scalar field is, is not charged under U1, and the two other have a charge plus one and minus one under, under this uh, U1 symmetry. And this is the superpotential, which is associated. Then you can compute uh, the F term potential, which is of this form. And now there is this extra potential, which is a D term potential, which includes this, uh, this uh, parameter Xi, which is uh, the Faye Heliopoulos parameter. And now if you look at the minimum of this, uh, of this potential, if you consider that phi zero is fixed, so phi zero is fixed, and you look for the minimum of this potential, you find that if phi zero is bigger than a critical value, then the minimum correspond to phi plus and phi, phi minus are, are zero, and, and you get this, this value for the minimum of the potential. So here, phi zero is going to play the role of the inflaton, and you see that you have found a kind of flat direction for this phi zero. So of course, if you include uh, the one loop correction, this flat direction, you get, you get some uh, effective potential for phi zero. So you get a potential for inflaton, for the inflaton, where you, you can have swirl inflation. And now you, s you can check that the swirl conditions are not spoiled anymore by the exponential term which comes from the, the F term potential because in this setup, uh, the F term potential vanishes. So it's a way to go around this uh, eta problem just by using another, another part of the potential as uh, the dominant part during inflation. So that, there are some uh, further refinement on this issue in a, in a more recent paper by, by Pierre and, and uh, Giad Valli. Uh, Renata Kalosh and, and Van Proyen. So let me move now to uh, another topic where uh, Pierre's work had a very strong impact. And I was privileged to be associated to this uh, work with, with Pierre. And this, this is uh, a work in brain cosmology. So this is in the context of brain worlds. And so the basic idea of brain worlds is uh, so that two ingredients, two major ingredients for brain worlds. The first one is you have extra dimensions. So it means you have a, a higher dimensional space time, which is called the bulk. So sorry for the colors, but this is the bulk here. And inside, inside this uh, higher dimensional space time, you assume that there is a, an object which is called a brain. So it, it's a lower dimensional uh, space time. And the key the key uh, assumption is that matter is confined in this brain. So you see that this is in contrast with Kaluza-Klein theories. Kaluza-Klein theories, you have extra dimension, but matter can live everywhere in the bulk. So in, uh, in brain worlds, matter is really confined in, in, uh, in a subspace. So brain worlds have been extremely, has been an extremely active topic because there are many motivations to study brain worlds. So there are stringy motivations because you find brains called D brains in the context of, of string theory. Uh, there is a, a model of this type, which is called the, the Orjava-Witten uh, theory, where you have one extra dimension. 
Of course, you have the, the link with the ads CFT correspondence if, if the bulk is ADS. This is something which was discussed in early in, during the conference. In particle physics, it can be a, a kind of solution or another approach to the hierarchy problem. So why the electroweak scale is much lower than the Planck scale. And in gravity, it can provide a, a new type of com compactification. So let, let me go to, to the work we, we did. In, so I, I met, I think I met uh, Pierre the first time in 98. Uh, it was in a, a kind of very small conference in an isolated village in south of France. And he gave a very interesting uh, talk on orjava witten model. And at the end of the talk, he, he, he said it, in the future it would be interesting to study the cosmology in, in such kind of setup. And so I went to, to see him just after the talk, and we started to discuss. And we started a, a kind of long-term collaboration on this problem. And, and Cédric de Fayet, who was a Pierre PhD student at that time, joined, joined us for, for this work. So here the idea is to study a brain which is inside a five-dimensional bulk space-time. So because we are studying the cosmology, we are assuming the usual symmetries of isotropy and homogeneity in the three uh, ordinary dimensions. So it means that the, the five-dimensional metric with this symmetry is of this form, where y is the extra dimension. So then now you, you can solve, you can try to solve the five-dimensional Einstein equations. So where you have the Einstein tensor, and on the right you have the energy momentum tensor. And now the energy momentum tensor is mainly due <coughs> to the presence of the brain, because all the matter is concentrated on the brain, which means that this energy, um, this energy momentum tensor is a distribution. So here you have a delta function. So if the brain is located at y equals zero, you have a delta function just, just at, the, at the level, at the location of the brain. And inside the brain, because we are studying cosmology, we have the energy density and the pressure, which are just time-dependent functions. And you can um, solve the Einstein equation by using the junction conditions. The junction conditions tell you how you the jump of the extrinsic curvature tensor is related to the matter content in the brain. So at the end of some calculation, I don't give you the details, you arrive to a kind of Friedman equation, but which is very unusual. It's a modified Friedman equation, where on the right-hand side, instead of having something which is linear in the energy density, uh, you have something which, is a, which goes like the square of the energy density in the brain. So it means that it leads to a completely different evolution, cosmological evolution, for example, between nuclear synthesis and today. And this is incompatible with all what we know about uh, cosmology. So the result, the main result of this paper was some, <coughs> somehow negative, because we concluded that this kind of brain worlds was incompatible with observations. But so this, this work appeared in May, and just a few weeks afterwards, there was a paper which appeared, which is a, a ver the very famous paper by, uh, due to Rondal and Sodrum. So in this paper, they don't consider at all cosmology. So their problem is, is fully static. But the setup is very similar to our setup because they look at a five-dimensional bulk. The main difference and the crucial difference is that they assume that this bulk is anti -dositor which means that there is a cosmological constant which is negative. And then they assume that there is some, matter, some uh, concentration of matter in the brain, which they call the brain tension, and there is a tuning between the brain tension and this uh, um, cosmological constant, negative cosmological constant. And the main result of their work is to show that in this kind of setup, you recover standard gravity on scales which are bigger than the length scale associated with this uh, negative cosmological constant. But now you see that it was very sim simple and natural to extend our results just to use our equation like this. So this one, 
to take into account the fact that there was now a cosmological constant in the bulk, so it appears here. There is just, you just have to add something. And now if you assume that the brain content is made of two components, one component is, uh, is the tension of the brain, the same tension as in Randall syndrome, and in addition to this tension, you have this cosmological, um, the usual cosmological energy density, you see that you can just expand this, this quartic term, this quadratic term. There will be a sigma b square which is going to cancel the cosmological constant because of this. And then you have a linear term which gives you back, which is of the usual form. So here you recover the standard Freeman equation. And you have correction which become important only in the very early universe. So this was, in some sense, one of the pioneering works in, in, the, in the field of uh, brain cosmology. So, so later in, uh, so of course I'm skipping many, many works by Pierre. I just want to stress a few of them, especially the ones I know the best. It's, it's always easier. But so in the last part, in the last part of his uh, scientific career, um, Pierre got more and more interested in gravitational physics. And somehow he anticipated that gravitational physics was going to open a, a completely new window uh, for physics, what we, we see today explicitly. Um, and so he, st he studied various aspects of, of first, he decided to be involved in, in, in the LISA collaboration. And he pushed very strongly so that friends would join this uh, uh, LISA program, and in particular APC, his, uh, his laboratory. So he also considered various aspects of gravitational, uh, gravitational waves. So some of this work were mentioned yesterday by, uh, by Chiara. So, for example, he, he studied uh, the production of gravitational waves from uh, cosmic strings. Uh, he also wrote uh, a review with uh, Chiara and, and, and two other people about the cosmological backgrounds of gravitational waves and what Lisa could tell us about, about them. He also worked on primordial gravitational waves from inflation in, in a kind of new framework. And he was also part of the LISA Pathfinder collaboration. So his name appears in, in the, the paper which was mentioned uh, twice yesterday about this, uh, this uh, fascinated results by LISA Pathfinder, which, which did much, much better than expected. So this is um, about the scientific career of Pierre. But Pierre was not only a, a, a very bright physicist, he was also a teacher, a remarkable teacher. And the kind of very inspiring teacher which is able to, who is able to transmit his passion to students. So as he was a professor in Orsay, he was a professor in, uh, in Paris Diderot here. And so he, he had hundreds of students over the years. But very recently, he decided somehow to have a larger audience because he wanted, he wanted to share his passion, not only with university students, but with everybody. And so he decided to invest his, his time and energy to a, a MOOC on gravitation, so an online course on gravitation for aim at the general public. So there were two, there, there, were, there was a French version and an English version. So th the title is almost the same, except the English version there is in addition gravitational waves. So you see that it's evolving in the title. And I, so I'm not sure about the figure, but I think at least uh, uh, <coughs> 90,000 people registered to this MOOC. So he, he had, uh, this had a, a very big impact. And for him, it was a kind of revolution that the revolution to transmit knowledge, not only to a few privileged people in university, but 
everywhere in the world. So teaching gravitation to, the, to a very large public was also the reason for this book, a popular book on gravitational waves, which he published a few years ago. And there is an English version which is going to appear soon. Finally, he was not only a physicist and a teacher, but he was also, in some sense, an organizer. So he played a crucial role in trying to organize, trying to, to, to give some uh, structure in the, in the French research, or even beyond the French research. So I think it, it's a rare example of a theorist who is ready to, to spend time and energy uh, to, to develop structure which are going to help for science. And in some sense, it was a very crucial and precious interface between the administration with their own priorities and the, and the science, the scientists with their scientific priorities. So one very well-known uh, example of uh, Pierre activities was the founding of a working group, which was called the uh, GDR, GDR SUSI, Supersymmetry, <coughs> to put together all uh, the French physicist working on supersymmetry, theorist, experimentalist, and to, to discuss together and to try to have new ideas. So I, I was never part of this uh, GDR, but I was told that it was extremely fruitful and, and Pierre was able to even to convince people to try new uh, directions, you know. He was able to, to, um, to motivate people into trying new things. Um, so Pierre was also played a, a crucial role in the foundation of a new lab, which is across the road, which is APC. And he was uh, the director of e APC for eight, eight years until, uh, until 12, 13. He also founded uh, with uh, George Smoot, who is here, the P PCCP, Paris Center for Cosmological Physics. And with uh, Marie Verler, who is also here as the main administrator of this, of this uh, center. So, of course, I'm not going to give you a list of all the committees he was a member of, because it, it would take a few pages. But I would like to emphasize that he was really an expert on all the intricacies of the, the French system. And just to illustrate this as on a kind of amusing note, this is a, a slide which I recover a slide that uh, Pierre prepared, I think five years ago, just to try to explain to the lab the structure of the landscape in the Paris era, of all the physics in the Paris era, with the universities, the labs, and the various connections. So I, I'm not going to try to explain to you the, this diagram, but, but Pierre was really an expert on this. He was able to, do, to draw it on a, on a blackboard in a, in a few seconds, and it was quite impressive. Um, and lately, he, he really pushed a lot to invest um, energy, to invest uh, funding um, into gravitational, uh, gravitational research. So he was convinced from the early days of APC, the APC lab, that, that uh, gravitational physics was going to become a, a, a central topic and he wanted to involve France in the special program on gravitational waves because no lab at all was involved in, 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 the, in the space program on, on gravitational waves. So APC, so he pushed APC to be involved in, in LISA and LISA Pathfinder. And uh, he was president of the LISA France Consortium, which unified the nine uh, laboratories. And very recently, and this was approved one year ago, and this is starting to, to, be, to be moving. Uh, it was responsible for the foundation of a new working group, this time devoted to gravitational waves. So, as you can see from these few examples, and I just chose a, a few examples, uh, somebody else could have chose completely different examples, you can see that Pierre managed to, to lead uh, several, in some sense, several successful careers in, uh, in parallel. And 
Of course, unfortunately for us, he crossed the horizon uh, five months ago, much too early, and this is a great loss for his friends, for his colleagues and, and the scientific community. So I have a slightly comforting idea. Is if you, because he died very young, if you count in terms of uh, proper years, but if we like physicists to define some kind of effective parameter. So if you define the, the effective number of uh, careers that Pierre had, you see that it's sig significantly uh, uh, more than one, and you can multiply by the number of years. And so he lived many, many years in, in this respect. Okay, but, and moreover, I'm sure that several elements of his legacy uh, are going to survive in the future and, and be able to make a, a big impact. Thank you very much. <laughs>